Today's reading is Revelations 3, 14 to 22. It is on page 993 in the Pew Bibles. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realise that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We, as you know, have commenced a journey through the book of Revelation and we've been looking at these various letters uh, to the churches that Jesus writes to the seven churches in, in Asia Minor. And today we look at the last one, the seventh one. And we've been saying that these churches are, are real churches that existed in the first century, but the message that they contain is relevant. It's timeless. It's for the universal church of God and so it's for us uh, this morning as well. Let me pray and we'll uh, look at this passage that Kathy read for us. Lord, would you... Um, I think of that word. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, would you give us ears to hear Oh God, that we wouldn't be um, deaf to what you're saying, oh God, through your spirit. Yeah, please speak, Lord Jesus, to us through this word, uh, that we might live and have strength and joy and greatly honour you. Please, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Each of these seven churches needed a word from Jesus. In each case, their great, great need is and was a, a word from Christ to them. And through John, um, he writes this letter and a word comes to each one exactly what each church needs. To some, it was a word of an encouragement when they're under terrible attack. And there's a word of Christ that comes in the midst of that, and, and it's an encouragement. To some, it's a warning um, that they wouldn't go wrong in their teaching and they wouldn't follow wrong doctrines. For some, it's to be told that they, although they think they're alive, they're actually dead. For some, it's a word um, that they've lost their first love and their first love is gone. Others, it's a commendation. It's a well done. Well done. Today, in this letter to the Laodicean church, the, the seventh letter, um, it's a word of Jesus to tell the church that they are lukewarm, that act, they're actually in a terrible state. But if you've got ears to hear, 
And if you've got a heart to hear, there is tremendous hope, unbelievable hope, actually, except that I believe it. Where is this um, church? Well, the church of Laodicea um, was in the kind of the southeast of Asia Minor. And there were some characteristics of this church. They, um, they were a wealthy church, perhaps more wealthy than any of the other of the... Well, they were a wealthy town, perhaps more wealthy than any of the other towns uh, that we've looked at. They had trade, they had a financial sector. There was banking in that town in ways that it wasn't present in other towns. And they were a town that was very secure in their wealth. They were famous for their textiles and um, for their clothing materials. And there was also a medical school in Laodicea. It was operating there. And it would produce salve, like ointment for eyes. And it was thought to be abundant there in Laodicea. And to this, this church uh, that lived in this city of Laodicea comes a word from Christ... Each time the Lord writes a letter to a church, he describes himself differently. Listen to how he describes himself to the church in Laodicea. Verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. He calls himself the Amen. These are the words of the Amen. It's like he's saying, these are the words of the one who says yes to every promise, to confirm all promises that are given by God. He, this is the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness. And when I think of that phrase, faithful and true witness, I think of Jesus standing before Pilate, and Pilate says, so you are the king of the Jews, are you? And Jesus says, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. (laughs) He says, the very reason I came into the world, no one else might testify to the truth, but I have come into the world to testify to the truth. And so here he's saying, I am, these are the words of the faithful and true witness. And he says, the ruler, he calls himself the ruler of all creation. So in other words, these are the words from the king, the ruler of all. So listen, we should listen. And what does he say? Well, he doesn't beat around the bush and he gets straight into it. And he says in verse 15, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. But because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. He says, I know your deeds. I know you. You might not think I know you, but I do. I know your deeds and you're neither hot nor cold. And the background of of this phrase, neither hot nor cold, is that there were two neighbouring towns to Laodicea. One was Hierapolis, and in Hierapolis there were hot springs. They were healing springs, hot water. And everyone knew of this water that was hot in Hierapolis, and it was highly valued for healing and life. But there was another town of Colossae, and in that town there was cold water from mountain, mountain springs that would bring refreshment, and it was considered healthy as well. But the one thing about Laodicea is that it had a very poor water supply and it had to pipe in the water from outside. And they had pipe it in with great, great big stone pipes that they made. And by the time it got to Laodicea, it was full of sediment and dirty and lukewarm. And people would come to Laodicea and they'd drink the water and they would say, yuck. This is, this is yucky. And they'd spit it out, spit it out. It's just, this is disgusting water. And what Jesus is saying is the water of this town 
is, is actually a good description of the faith of you as a church. You're disgusting. And I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Not my words. They're Jesus' words. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And he makes it clearer still. He says... You say to yourselves in verse 17, I am rich and I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. You say to yourself, I'm rich. The church is very, very self-satisfied. They, they're saying, look, we are fine. We're just going great. We're, we're, we have wealth. We do not need a thing. And it seems like the wealth of the, of the town, the, the richness of the town, has found itself all the way into kind of the hearts of the church and the believers in a way that in Jesus' mouth is disgusting. Because they're very, very comfortable. They're so sure that they've got it all together. We don't need a thing. We are totally fine. We're going great guns. And their self-confidence has blinded them. Do you know, often when I go to Sydney or Melbourne or somewhere, someone will come to me and they'll say, um, so how's the church going? This church says, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, I do not need a thing, but you do not realise. You don't realise. Your self-assessment is a mess. You don't realise. When someone comes to me and says to me, David, how's the church going? What should I say? Should I say, oh, we're going great. <clears throat> We've got this happening and this happening and this happening. Is that the right answer? Do you know what I often say? I say that's a very difficult question to answer. Because there are many, many things that I am genuinely thankful for. And that's true. I am. And I don't want to despise what God is doing. I don't want to say, I don't want to not give thanks for the beautiful, beautiful things that God does in his gracious love and his tender care and growing people in faith and love. I don't want to despise that at all. But Jesus speaks to the Laodicean church who are saying, we're great. And he says, you did something you don't realize. You're deluded about yourself. Your self-assessment is way off. In fact, what you think about yourself is the opposite to the truth. <laughs> when you look in a mirror, Laodicean church, you go and look in the mirror and you look at yourself and you say, actually... I'm pretty good. I look pretty great. I pretty look pretty beautiful. I'm pretty impressed, actually, with what I see. And Jesus says, in my eyes, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Like, in my eyes, you think you're so great. You think that you're so secure and that you do not need a thing. But in my eyes, I see you like a homeless person that is blind and sick and naked in the gutter. I just don't see what you see. Your perception of yourself is just not what I see. How could this be? Because we don't see with God's eyes. Often we look with human eyes. 
I wonder about your own personal self-assessment for you. Just for you. How would you rate your, your spiritual health? What would you say? You know, I want to be very careful here. Because for some of you, there's a great doubt that's gripped your heart. And you don't know whether you belong to Jesus. And you're always wondering, am I really his? Am I really safe in his love? Am I really belonging to him? And the word of Christ to you is... As you trust in Christ, no one can snatch you out of his hands. And you belong to him and you're safe in him. But there's others who think that they're just fine. And and the Lord would want to say to us, Have you got faith like gold? Have you got faith like gold? What about your love? Where's your love? What about your joy? Have you got joy? (laughs) What about your peace in your heart? Have you got any? What about your courage? Have you got courage? Where are you? And your self-assessment might not be what Jesus considers it to be. But the Lord gives a word of hope. And it's a beautiful word of hope. It's a word of light and hope. He tells you straight. If you go to the doctor and he just tells you lies about what your truth of your health is, then that's bad news. But, But if the doctor tells you the truth, then you can start. That's a blessing. When the Lord tells me the truth about my heart, that is a blessing. If he doesn't cause me to realize just how sick I am spiritually, then I'm hopeless. But if he opens my eyes to see, do you know that verse in Amazing Grace? It was grace who taught my heart to fear. What does that mean? Your heart fears. That's grace if your heart learns to fear and realizes your real situation and and grace my fears relieved. But the first step is to, to learn that there's something wrong. But having learned that there's something wrong, then Jesus has got a word. And this is what he says to those who have realized. If you realize that you need him, this is his word. 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. I want you actually to be rich. I want you to be richer than you've ever believed you could be rich. But it's not with the gold that goes in this ear here or around here or on your fingers here or that the richness of your huge properties and whatever. No, it is a richness. It is a gold. It is a, a, a treasure way beyond anything you've ever imagined i want you to come to me buy from me gold refined in the fire that phrase reminds me of 1 peter chapter 1 where it talks about our faith which is like gold and when i think of this precious pastor and brother who died at six o'clock this morning i'll tell you what His body was all finished, coming to an end. But I'll tell you what he had. He had gold. He had faith. And it shone. Beautiful. And if you think that you're just going to store up your stuff in this world and that that is going to be your treasure and that is going to be your love, then you have chosen wrong. Come to Christ and have gold. Faith in the living one. He says, I want you to have gold, everlasting gold, and white clothes that you can wear. Now, some of you, 
You feel so dirty. You feel so filthy. And Jesus is saying, I've got some white clothes for you. Want them? Do you want them? I got them. I dress you. I give them. And here he is dying on the cross for our sins and everything filthy put on him. And in the process, he's giving us white robes so that you can be dressed in white. I've got that for you. And not only white clothes, but salve for your eyes. Did you know that we are stumbling around? Yes, me too. Unless we have something to heal our blindness, so all of a sudden we can see. We need salve for our eyes. Do you know all of these three, the gold, the clothes, the salve for the eyes, point to one thing and it is Christ. It's spiritual resources. It's spiritual life that only God can give in Christ. And he's saying to you, come, come to me and buy from me. And when I think of that word buy, I think of Isaiah 55, where it says, come buy without money and without price. I love that. Without money or without price. Come and receive from me. And so I want to say to you, dear sisters and brothers, that the Lord of heaven is saying to you, I've got gold for you. Do you want it? Would you like it? I've got white clothes for you. Would you like to be dressed? Cover your shameful nakedness. I've got salve for you. I've got medicine for your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. It's like a summary. He said, if I didn't love you, if I didn't love you, I would never rebuke you. I'd just let you go. In Romans it says, God gave them over. And their hearts, they just said, okay, if that's what you want. But, but if he loves you, he rebukes you. And so the response and the solution is repentance. Be earnest. Repent. Repent is I'm going this way and I'm just pursuing everything or what in my well. And then if I repent, I turn and I go to Christ and I turn my back on everything that used to allure me and attract me and delight me that was just untrue. And now I go to the one who's true. And I repent and be earnest and repent. And then a very personal word he gives. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Imagine this. He's saying to the Laodicean church, Here I am. I stand at the door. I'm knocking. Just imagine if we're the Laodicean church now and Jesus is out and the doors are closed and he's out there. Anyone in there? Anyone there? Are you there? Anyone there? The the church that Jesus owns that he purchased, that he loves, he's locked out of. And the Laodicean church are having a great time inside. And he's asking permission, can he come in? Would it be okay if I came in? If anyone hears my voice, if anyone can hear the knocking, if anyone can hear the voice, if anyone hears the voice and opens the door, Is there anyone here this morning and you can hear the Lord knocking on your door? Can you hear his voice and he's calling you and saying, come, will you come? And he says, if you open the door, would you open the door? He says, this is the promise. I will come in and eat with you and you with me. And in Israel, 
at that time, in ancient times, to eat with someone is to fellowship with them, is to have intimacy with them, is to know them deeply, is to have unity and love and relationship. And Jesus is saying, I'm knocking at your door and I want to come in. And I want you to know, everyone that's within the sound of my voice this morning, I want you to know that the Lord wants intimacy with you. He doesn't just sort of want to live and there's a perspex sheet up there and God's up there and we just live our lives down here and do our best. That's not true. What's true is that he wants to come in. He's knocking on the door of your heart. He wants to know you. He wants to eat with you. He wants to live with you. Whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Not that I might come in or that I could come in or if I feel like I'll come in, I will come in. And they will eat and, and eat with that person, with that person. And they with me. I want to share the deep blessings, he says. I want to come in and give you all the blessings. I want to come in and give you the richness and the life and the hope. I'll bring you the gold and I'll bring you the clothes and I'll bring you the eye salve. I'll, I'll do, do you hear me? He says, I'm knocking on the door. And then he gives a promise in the last two verses. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. I tell you what, that really boggles my mind. To the one who is victorious, I take that to mean to the one who doesn't just surrender to this world and I'm just going to live for the world and I'm surrendered to the world. It's not that. It's someone who is victorious in their faith in the living one who is victorious in their love for God and their faith in Christ and their service of him. To that one, I hope there's many of you here this morning, that instead of the world just coming in and just dominating your life and you are surrendering to everything in the world, no, you trust in the living one and you are victorious. And to the one that is victorious, this is what he says, I will give the right to sit on my throne. Listen, Christ is saying to you in some way that my brain cannot even comprehend, that he will give you, if you're victorious, if you trust him, if you live for him, he's putting you in a place of great honor and in fact a place of great authority. But it's not because you're great. It's because he is great and he is merciful. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so dear brothers and sisters, do you have ears? Is there anyone here that's got ears? Whoever has ears, let them hear. Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That things are not great. In fact, they're terrible. But there is an offer that the King of Glory is putting out there, which is rich and beautiful, gold and clothes, white and, and salve and healing for your eyes and a place on the throne and intimacy with the Lord of Lords. He's offering that to you. He's offering it to us all. It's the richest and most magnificent offer that you could possibly imagine. And so I'm wanting to encourage you, listen. Listen for the knocking of the door. And open the door. Make your self-assessment. Be careful of your self-assessment and listen to the assessment of Jesus about your life. And come and receive from him all that is good and gracious and hope giving. Let me pray. Lord, we are your people. 
We open the door. Come in, Lord Jesus. Come in. Come in. We want to turn, Lord, from pursuing things that are just filthy and wrong. And, and we want to turn to you, O oh God. We want you to be our wealth. We want you to be our brightness. We want you to be our healing and our life. O oh God, Heavenly Father, thank you for Christ. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to the churches. Thank you for speaking to our hearts and lives. We turn again, O oh God, and trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.